uh, zero carbon by 2050. Uh, and I guess, you know, as you're all here, you understand the benefits of, of hedgerows and certainly John will tell us more. But the economics of hedgerows are also important. And new research that's just been conducted by the Organic Research Centre on behalf of National CPRE has found that the benefits of setting and achieving this, this target for increase of hedgerows uh, would not only be uh, for climate and nature, but uh, because uh, but 40% uh, more hedgerows would also result in over 25,000 more jobs in hedgerow planting and maintenance in both rural and urban areas. So uh, their conclusion was that if the right hedgerows are planted in the right place, for every one pound we invest in hedgerow planting, uh, we generate almost four pounds for the wider economy. Um, so there's lots of great reasons to be, to be planting hedge, hedges. Uh, and nationally, CPRE is pushing the government to, to sign up to this 40 by 50, uh, i.e. to set this 40% target of increase in hedgerows by 2050. And over 36,000 people so far have already signed our petition on this matter. Um, so uh, if you haven't yet done so, please, please do. And you'll find that on our national CPRE website. Uh, the picture in Oxfordshire, I mean, CPRE Oxfordshire has a, a long history of getting involved in hedgerows, and we conducted uh, a lot of uh, what weren't called citizen science, citizen science surveys then, but would be now in the 1990s. A lot of work with volunteers and parishes uh, mapping hedgerows, and all that information is now held with the Thames Valley Environmental Records Centre, so is, is already starting to be a really useful historical resource. Um, but more recently, uh, the Oxford Treescape Project has published a report, Our Land, Our Future, uh, and that has, has updated some of those figures. So we estimate that there are about 13,000 kilometres of hedges in Oxfordshire. Uh, and if we're going to try and meet that 40% target increase by 2050, uh, we would uh, need to increase the total percentage of hedged fields uh, by about 20% in, in that time. That's, that's our agricultural hedges. Um, so CPR Oxford is doing its bit. We're delighted that we are one of five uh, hedgerow projects that are being supported by the national CPRE. And our particular focus is, in Oxfordshire is on uh, working with local communities, so both to deliver hedge planting but also to engage communities and help to increase the understanding of hedges and why they're important. So obviously tonight is part of that. Uh, and we'd be delighted to be working with Wild Oxfordshire that many of you will know, who are effectively our delivery partner on this and are doing uh, most, the majority of the work on, on the ground. Um, so the, the project really consists in working at the moment in, in three parishes, uh, Watlington in South Oxfordshire, Kidlington uh, in uh, Charwell uh, and uh, Ensham in West Oxfordshire. Uh, and the, the aim is to plant uh, and restore over two kilometres of hedgerow uh, alongside hedge lane training, hedgerow management training for landowners, uh, and also the intention of creating an Oxfordshire hedge network that can be there for, for the longer term after this immediate project has finished to continue providing best practice and advice and exchange of information because there are a lot of people now starting to get on board and we, and we need that coordination. Uh, so how can you get involved? Well, obviously you can join in if you're interested in volunteering or keen to get involved. If you have any expertise, we'd be delighted to hear from you. You could ask your parish council uh, what they're doing on hedges and encourage them to get in touch with us. Um, uh, you can uh, obviously keep in, you know, get in touch and keep in touch. Both Wild Oxfordshire and CPRE Oxfordshire have monthly newsletters that are free to subscribe to. So that's a really good way uh, of keeping in touch with what's happening. Uh, and in due course, we are going to be publishing a hedge pledge that you can sign up to, which in which you can make a, a commitment to uh, look after our, our local hedges. Um, and if you 
enjoyed tonight's talk by John. Uh, I would also point you to a number of talks that are coming up, um, being organised by Wild Oxfordshire, but as part of our broader Hedgerow Heroes project. Um, so there's, there's details of them there and also on the Wild Oxfordshire website. Um, uh, so uh, I do encourage you to, to check out some of those. Uh, um, they all sound interesting, but obviously uh, I'm particularly interested in the one on the 24th of November because that is a uh, speaker from our national team, national CPRE team, who will be talking about sort of hedgerows and the planning system. Um, so a, a really interesting talk. Uh, and uh, as Richard has also mentioned, there's also two more talks in our own series of lectures. Uh, so reducing our demand for water next week uh, is actually uh, really interesting. Andrew Tucker is a, a great speaker, a, a very straight talking Australian uh, who has, has lived through water shortages in Australia uh, and speaks very eloquently about how we mustn't wait uh, to be trying to cope in a crisis, but need to act now. Uh, and the measures, talking about the measures that uh, both water companies can take, but also us as individuals. So I do encourage you to register for that. Uh, and I think that's me done. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and uh, I think probably hand straight over to John, if I may. Um, John, thank you for joining us joining us tonight delighted to have you here uh and um i'll stop talking well, thank thank you very much for the for the introduction um and uh, richard uh, are you hearing me okay is everybody hearing me okay yeah, fine for me yeah good good i shall carry on right, can um, i just before you start john can i just sure. say if anybody's got any questions for helen uh, we'll pick up all the questions for John and Helen at the end of the meeting at about eight o'clock, I think. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, okay, well, uh, uh, thank you, Richard, for the introduction um, earlier. Um, I'm, you, you, you introduced me as an expert on hedgerows. I would not uh, claim such expertise. I did write a book about it once, uh, but when you have people like uh, Pollard and Rackham uh, who wrote about hedgerows, I um, I, 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 I do not take the honour of being in their company. I am a bit. Of, uh, I just, I just write what I see and what I learn. Um, we, I'm going to join. Uh, start the uh, the screen. Screen. This we had a lot of trouble with this earlier. Uh, but let's see if we can do it. Oh dear. Okay, let's select the screen. Okay. Right. Is that gone? Oh, I see. Sorry, this is a trouble we were having. Uh, could you be, be so kind as to bear with me? I think we're nearly there. It says, uh, does anybody, any tech there? Your browser is preventing access to your share screen. Uh, share screen. Yeah, that's not working anymore. That was working just now. Uh, Richard, anyone there that could help me here? Uh, I'm sorry, John, I don't know. I don't know if there's anybody else on the call who knows. It was working beautifully. It was just about. Five yeah. to seven. About a different um, Would that help? Sorry, sorry, Jules. What were you saying? What about using a different browser? Would that help at all? Like if it's... Ooh, I'm not sure I have one. Um... I don't know why Matthew should be doing that. Oh dear. Well, do you want me to try and share it from this end, John? Yeah. I think we might have to do that, just which is a bit <laughs> annoying. Let me just give it one more go. Is, is everybody, uh, no one else is sharing their screen, are they? No. No. Uh, 
I've no, I've no idea how to fix that. We'll have to go from your end, I'm afraid. And um, it's not, it's not quite as good, unfortunately. But so we did try it earlier when we were having trouble then. So perhaps you'll give it a go now. Okay. Um, can you get, that's. Can you get to the back? Okay. Am I going backwards or forwards there? Go back, go up. Yeah, we're gonna, yeah, we're going, you're, you're nearly there. Uh, giving, giving all the stories away here. No, nah, that's why I'm trying to do it really quickly. So nobody, no, nobody, everybody, close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <sighs> right. Are we there? Okay. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I shall I shall uh, give you a nudge every now and then, Helen, when uh, it's uh, it's time to uh, uh, change. Uh, well, welcome to this slightly delayed uh, talk on hedgerows. I did say I'm not an expert. I've just written a book about it. I do spend an awful lot of time in hedgerows. I've been researching a new book recently, and it was a, a series of walks which uh, took me took me around a lot of hedgerows, uh, and uh, and it was a very slow business. So but this is a quick run through on hedgerows. I um, I, I feel I am talking, uh, preaching to the converted, uh, uh, singing to the choir, uh, but and uh, and indeed there's a lot of people here who know a great deal more about natural history than do I. So I I, I give this uh, I give this. Uh, mini lecture with a certain amount of respect. Um, so that's a, a local uh, bit of landscape that's about uh, about a half a mile from my house. Um, this is in darkest Dorset. You can see the uh, the chalk hills there. Um, I do love uh, living on the chalk. Um, we do have lots of hedgerows as you can see and I think we go to the next slide which is by the way everybody uh, carry on uh, Helen uh, and again next slide yeah uh, oh, up up Oh, back. That's it. Uh, uh, so this is a, a quick resume of hedges. Are you uh, are you going? How how old are hedges? Well, um, that was really a. Uh, this is flicking through. Is it supposed to be flicking through? You're on mute. mute. Sorry, I was trying to go back there. Yeah. Um, yes. What are what are hedges? Let's let's do that then. Uh, what are Hedges for that was a, a question that rather puzzled me, and uh, I had to think about it long and hard. But of course, it, it's not all that obvious. Could you do the next slide, please? Uh, well, I, I came up with this list. Uh, enclosing stock is probably the uh, original reason for it. Once. Uh, um, agriculture came to be a practice, uh, then you needed to keep stuff in one place. You also needed to stop uh, things going from one place on your uh, a little bit of land to another. You didn't want you didn't want necessarily want the sheep mixed up with uh, with the uh, the cattle. Uh, you want you may may have wanted to keep um, a different the, the mothers and uh, the ewes and their offspring from the ram and so on that that sort of thing uh, also protecting stock and crops that's really obvious uh, they were of course it, it, when they were first uh, devised they would be seriously protecting stock because there was a lot of nasty things out there which we which you no longer have well they're very lovely things but they're not very welcome to the farmer such as wolves and bears and uh, and you don't want to you don't want to things eating your crops uh, and indeed you don't want your own animals eating your crops shelter of course that's a, a minor consideration but that still works today prevention of soil erosion yes of course um, not such an issue but occasionally down here we see uh, someone's entire field being washed into the road when they plowed an unfortunate time when the rains came uh, utility this was a very important one one very dear to my own heart uh, uh, the, uh, the hedgerow as a resource, I guess, is not a terribly important resource for us now, uh, because we um, uh, we can get we can get just about everything we want uh, just at the cl click of a mouse button or a wander down the shops. But in the past, it was a very important source in difficult times uh, when food was short uh, for food, so there was a wild harvest, and and there was also things like uh, wood. Um, uh, some of the trees would have been pollarded, so there would be some very useful timber coming from uh, coming from hedgerows. Uh, most important one is perhaps ownership boundary. People love uh, love their boundaries and you need to, yeah, it's my land and your land. And there's a question mark at the end. Um, that is the, this is the, uh, the reason for having hedges that would have never occurred to our predecessors. And that 
is a natural history resource and refuge. Uh, let's see what the next slide. By the way, I've I've just revamped this uh, this talk, uh, so the next slide will come as as much surprise to me as it does to you. Is it coming up? Uh, yes, quickly, how old are hedges? Uh, well, the next slide, please. This is uh, the next picture is picture is about uh, about 10 miles from my house. This is uh, Valley of Stones and uh, it's been dated. This is Bronze Age. You can see a, a very distinct uh, field system here and it's kind of a vast area that's about uh, about a quarter, maybe a fifth of it. And you can see distinct field systems. Uh, these are big banks. Big banks on their own aren't useful. Uh, they uh, they any stock could just wander up there and over the other side. So uh, it is inferred, and there's nothing stronger than that can be said, it is inferred that these were hedges. They may not have been hedges as we know them, uh, planted hedges, growing hedges. They may have been dead hedges, but I think I suspect it would take an awful lot of work to keep those supplied with dead hedges, which soon, um, soon rot away. And indeed, if it started with a dead hedge, then it's quite possible that, uh, uh, that a live hedge would inadvertently uh, appear and, uh, and that could be laid or uh, tr uh, made more useful in some way or another. Next one, uh, please, Helen. Uh, this uh, this is one of the fields that uh, rather puzzled Oliver Rackham, apparently. My friend knew him quite well. And this, again, is up just up the road. This is the wonderful uh, Kinker Meadows Nature Reserve. And this is a, bro a, bro a part of a bronze, we think it's part of a Bronze Age field system. These are tiny, tiny fields. And you can see these, these hedges are absolutely wonderful. We'll come back to those later. Helen, please. Uh, we go over over this rather quickly. Uh, Oxfordshire, of course, was uh, you employed the open field system. So uh, whatever hedges you you have now, and however you uh, may think you are hard done by with hedges in the past, you were probably you were likely to be much worse off for hedges. Many more were. Uh, were um, uh, planted when this open field system, I think this is Laxton, uh, actually a map which cost me a fortune to uh, to get permission to use it from uh, from the college where it is kept when I published my book. Uh, it's a wonderful map. Do look up the length of the Laxton uh, map, which shows you all the uh, all the allotments. Uh, there's there's a, a few very large fields. They may or indeed may not have have had hedges between them. They would have had a rather woody hedge or the way around the uh, the manor and um, that's about it the rest of it was open and it still is uh, if any if you want to go to Laxon it's in Not Nottinghamshire and it's really well worth the, the visit as long as you like landscapes with no hedges next slide please these were all done away with uh, I should Sorry, I wasn't expecting that one. Uh, the, of course, uh, the the open field system was done away with in the enclosure period. Uh, it, enclosure happened for over a, a very very long period, but the the main one is uh, 1750 to 1850. Uh, much of the land was enclosed, and that uh, that reason for having enclosures came into effect. The, uh, the setting boundaries, and that's when thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of hedges, millions and millions of trees were planted uh, to form the hedges that we see today. In fact, there may have been uh, a few more uh, than, than we can see now, certainly would be, uh, because they actually got rid of quite a few of them because uh, they realized they'd rather overdone it and they were making fields that were too small. So there was a hedge, hedge loss happened even in the 19th century. Next slide, please. Uh, what was the question before? What? Yeah, sorry, I didn't answer that question. <laughs> Could you go back one, please? I'm sorry. What constitute a hedge? Well, uh, it's uh, yep. Yeah, next slide, please. It kind of depends on on what hedge you're you're talking about. In in Oxfordshire, you will have mostly it will mostly be hawthorn. Well, that's a, that's a very important hedge hedgerow uh, tree. The the best of all the hedgerow trees. I think um, uh, it you know, ticks all the boxes. The only thing really wrong with it, in my opinion, is that you can't eat it very well. It's nothing on there tastes particularly nice. You can eat the haws, uh, but they're not particularly uh, of, uh, of giving. Um, I rather, uh, I, I've always thought they be much better off using mangoes or something like that but perhaps mangoes don't grow too well in Oxfordshire I don't know uh, down here we have very different hedges uh, to you we certainly have hawthorn but uh, well blackthorn and hazel tend to dominate uh, down this way uh, should we go to the next one please 
Uh, so this Hawthorne is ninety. This is that doesn't mean ninety percent of every hedge is 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 Hawthorne. It's ninety percent of hedges have Hawthorne, fifty uh, percent have Blackthorn countrywide, and thirty three percent have Elder. I was rather surprised by that high figure. Elder is not something you particularly want in a hedge. It's very nice for making your elderberry wine. And uh, of course, but uh, uh, it's not a very good hedge tree, hedge, hedgerow uh, shrub or tree. Next slide. And, and these are the also rands, although of course they can uh, dominate. I've seen entirely elm hedges really quite recently, and uh, the others uh, just keep going. Uh, of course, these, these are just the main trees. Some of them will be left as standards, some of them will be laid. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, types of hedges. I'll just run through these very quickly. I hatch. I do. Next slide, please. The next. Um, uh, this is this is one of yours. This is near uh, Chipping Norton. Yes, Chipping Norton. I rather love this way that they've uh, they've wound it around the trees. Um, uh, that's rather beautiful. I, I guess that's in much better. It's just been laid, uh, and probably looking much bushier now. But you, you won't probably won't better see its glorious structure anymore. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is one I laid myself at Chipping Norton under the tutelage of a gentleman called John. I can't remember his second name. And uh, I think I made a rather good job of it. I did the first six feet that you can see there. It took me two days. It's really hard work laying a hedge. I, I don't recommend it at all. Next slide. Just to prove it. There we go. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is a one, one of uh, the Oxfordshire hedge very nearby, and you can see it's rather it's just a touch dull, a very big ditch. Uh, there's very little um, understory um, uh, hedge. It's sort of, I think there might be a little bit of sort of set aside um, alongside alongside it, which uh, doesn't show up at its best in February. Um, that's a, a, a fairly typical modern hedge. Certainly a very fairly typical uh, enclosure hedge. Next slide. Uh, this is one in Devon. This is uh, quite different. It's two rows. The other one, the Oxfordshire one, the Midland hedge, as it's called, uh, was a single row. Uh, but this is a typical Devon hedge on a on a, a bank made of uh, soil and uh, uh, piled up from the ditch you can see on the left and uh, with two rows. Uh, some of them are quite big and you could walk down the middle even when it's in full leaf in summer. So next slide. Uh, this is uh, one of the sort of poorer probably I'm not sure it's enclosure. That's a, a very a, a, a simple hedge, just a single row. Uh, that's just been trimmed, of course, not laid properly. But you know, it's, it's better it's there and trimmed and strimmed rather than not there at all. I thought uh, this is a nice one to see because you see the green bit there. This is me with my foraging hat on. Uh, that uh, uh, that's a gooseberry. And if you ever wondered how how to find a gooseberry in a hedge you look early in the year because it's the first one to leaf up then you you get a little red tie or something or, or get the gps location or the what three words location of it and you can go go back in uh, uh, in late spring early summer and, and pick some gooseberries although they will you will be disappointed i'm afraid because uh, they're not very productive next slide please uh, this is a Cornish hedge, not a wall. If you go to Cornwall and see one of those, you say, that's a nice wall. You'll get a smack in the face because it's not a wall, it's a hedge. Uh, it, it is a hedge. It's uh, it, uh, What grows on it is almost inadvertent, uh, but uh, most most of them are vegetated. This one's got, got a nice little bit of grassland on top. Um, this is, uh, I'm not sure what time of the year it, but it certainly wasn't uh, winter. Uh, but these are rather magnificent things. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is just down the road from me, just across in the next valley. This is my friend's on my friend's farm, and this is a most hedges at their most glorious, forming a a, um, a green a green path. And uh, it's just oh, that wonderful arch. It's very very beautiful. I'm sorry you can only see a small version of it. Next slide, please. Oh, that shouldn't be there. Keep going. Ah, so I was. I think this got. Just keep going. I'll tell you when to uh, stop her. Um, keep going. Yeah, keep going. 
Hedro loss. Okay, we're back back on back on track. Uh, Hedro loss. Um, I should do this very briefly. I've got a few slides here, which you unfortunately can't see desperately well. I did do. I uh, spent quite a lot of time uh, uh, surveying hedges uh, from the comfort of my own armchair. For about I spent about two weeks counting and measuring bits, and I didn't quite have the technology in those days. So I had to print stuff out and get one of those little wheelie things that measure hedges and uh, try to work out the loss. I couldn't uh, really work out. Uh, the the losses that uh, are reported, I was getting about 25-30% losses of hedgerows and I did about 20 different parts of the countryside. Okay, I didn't do town, so that would be some of the one of the reasons. Could you just flick through these uh, fairly quickly? Uh, well, uh, so that's Lincolnshire. I don't think they ever have very big hedges, maybe in certain parts before drainage, of course. Uh, keep going. Uh, there's there's that. Uh, the, uh, the 1903 map on the left shows you that really weren't that many big, uh, not that many small fields. Um, you can see a few there, but there's not a huge change there. Uh, and you're not, and of course they were just fields. Uh, the map shows field boundaries rather than edges. So who knows what was there before? Next slide. Now, uh, one thing I've noticed was that uh, you can, if you imagine two squares, two square fields abutting one another, you can double the area of a field by removing one seventh of the hedge. Uh, and that's the one dividing the two abutting um, uh, fields. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can you can increase field size uh, considerably with re relatively little hedge loss, and that has been done many times. And those two arrows show show you where this has been done. Next slide. Uh, these are all on the same scale. This is Dorsetshire. Uh, yes, yes I, I guess we've lost hedges here, but this probably wasn't hedged much anyway, because this was open down then. Uh, much more important uh, to, to everybody, and certainly as far as I'm concerned, that this is loss of uh, a, a perhaps an even more important uh, um, ecology, and that is uh, our chalk downlands, which is now ploughed and put over to a rather dull crops, um, some of which, most of which don't even go for food, they may go for fodder, but a lot of them go for a biofuel, which I don't entirely agree with. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, Devon, these are on the same scale. You see how many, many more hedges you're getting in Devon than, than you do in uh, certainly edging towards East Dorset and very different from Lincolnshire, just about everywhere else. Uh, this is ancient countryside without the open field system. Uh, and a lot of these fields were caught, uh, created by a sarting. If you see a curved edge, then it's probably just been cut out of the uh, the primeval forest. Next, next slide. Uh, where you go. Um, I wondered why I was getting such a so much lower numbers uh, uh, for loss, uh, but I think it's the how the hedges are counted as hedges. Uh, this is in the middle of a wood, and it was once a hedge. Uh, it may well have been a boundary hedge, but there's one not far away which couldn't have been a bound, bound, very similar to it, which couldn't have been a boundary hedge as well. Uh, it's beech. Um, beech is usually used in boundary hedges, or frequently found in boundary hedges. Um, uh, this is no longer a hedge. It's not counted as of any ecological value. It's a very boring spruce forest now. But this is an amazing uh, a bit of a landscape on a miniature scale. And there's, there's a great deal of biodiversity in here, especially when the beech trees start falling down, because you get a lot of fast, fascinating things from beech trees. Should you do another slide, please? Uh, yeah, these are bonds. These are this is a bonsai hedge. This is clearly a hedge once there before. You can see the bank, or the rudiments of a bank uh, there on the left. Um, I, I mean, there is some use to it. Uh, these are hawthorn, I think. Uh, at least it's a place for birds to perch. Uh, see lots of these. Next, please. Uh, this is in Endeavour, and you can see this has definitely been laid, but who can say those trees are of little value? They, uh, the main problem is that they eventually die, fall down, and then no one's going to plant a hedge uh, in, in its place. Next, please. Um, I, I look at uh, hedges perhaps in a different way to many people. I, I worry more about the species contents than what the hedge looks like. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it's certainly remarkable. I, I noticed you have uh, Rob Walton, and I can, can I join that one, Helen? Just put a thumbs up if, I, if you say I can join it. I don't know if you can hear me. Can I can I join in the uh, uh, watch watch the talk with uh, Rob Walton on the day? Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure you can. Yes. Yes. Thank yeah. you. yes. I, I met him, and uh, and uh, he. I, I don't want to take away his thunder because he wrote something up in British Wildlife, which was very impressive. He has a uh, a hedge, and I went to see it with him uh, in front of his house in Devon, just near. Um, oh, 
just to, just just to the north of uh, Dartmoor. And I think it's about uh, 90 metres long, maybe mis misremembering that. And he did a survey over two years uh, to count the number of species of just about everything that he could name or that could be named by him and his uh, more specialist friends. And he got to 2,200 when I met him. This is in the 90 metre hedge. OK, it was a very good hedge and it was uh, in full leaf and uh, uh, it, was, it was fairly it frankly it needed laying but it was uh, hugely species rich most of these of course would have been were invertebrates i think he found a hundred fungi i reckon i could have found a few more but uh, uh, I, I i thought that was quite remarkable that in so short a space you could get so many species i did the same sort of thing albeit on one day and taking my friend brian who is one of these people who really annoys me because he knows absolutely everything he spends his entire life uh, doing uh, NVC National Vegetation Classification Surveys. Uh, he can name he can name just about everything. You'll see a little bit more of his abilities later. Uh, well, we walked a hedge uh, uh, up at Kinkham. Uh, uh, Kinkham Meadows just down the road two miles from my house and uh, I think it's about 70 meters and on the verge he the verge and the hedgerow altogether he counted a hundred species of plant uh, he also named all the grasses even though they're out of season I mean that is that sort of ninth down isn't it naming grasses out of season well at least as far as I'm concerned uh, let's, let's see what the next slide has to show us There we go. Oh, that's uh, that's Rob Walton's hedge. Yeah, so I give that's his dog there, I think. You see, I said that's pretty leafy, isn't it? Uh, cow parsley. I'm not, I'm not really keen on, on cow parsley. Not too bad there, but it does get a bit overgrown sometimes. Uh, another one, please. Uh, of course, there's all the, the the sheer beauty of hedges as well. Some of the species are beautiful. Uh, frankly, I I mean I'd love the beauty to see. I think this is a field rose. Uh, I'd love to see them uh, the flowers in the hedgerows, and as as does everybody. But I tend to like to look a little bit closer uh, than most, perhaps, and look at some of the some of the details. Next slide, please. Oh, this is what this was uh, nestling in a, a rather deteriorated ash tree. Uh, I haven't given it given it a name, but it's uh, it's Pluteus. There is a little group of these golden Pluteus species which nestle in extremely rotten uh, ash trees, and this is one of this is the sort of thing I look out for. Uh, next, please. Uh, this doesn't look very impressive, but those uh, those disc fungi, they're actually basidiomycetes. And I guess a fair proportion to know what a basidiomycete is. It means it's related to the uh, most most of the fungi we know, so-called uh, basidiomycetes, which includes mushrooms and, most, and toadstools, uh, but not morels. It's usually these little cut fungi are ascomycetes, but this is a basidio ask, uh, a cut fungus. Uh, the individual cups, this, I, this was taken under my microscope, hence it being a bit fuzzy. The average cup there is a millimeter across so i was rather pleased with that photograph um, my friend brian here we go you'll hear a lot about brian he should be giving this talk uh, uh he's not as good looking as me though so uh, i mean that's a good reason enough um he, he came to me very excited one day he said oh, look at this look at this dead nettle stem i found in a hedge and uh, i looked at it and it's sort of just a bit grubby and very old um but he'd found five species of fungus on this uh, single stem i think it might be more six i think it was uh he was very excited about that so this is the thing I look out for. Um, next, please. Oh, as I said everyone's a surprise to me. Um, uh, this is a, a, a Philopora ribis. This is growing on spindle, quite a rarity. Because spindles are very common in um, in hedgerows, certainly down here. And this is a rather magnificent thing, and really only ever found in a hedge. How often do you see a spindle tree anywhere else? Occasion. If if you do, it's usually on a wood edge. Next, please. Uh, yeah, uh, this is occasionally you get holly in a hedge. Um, this is a Marasmus hudsonii. The the cap of this is about three, two, it's about two millimeters in diameter. So that's one of those another another one of those tiny things that I, I love. Next, please. Uh, yeah, we're talking. Well, I'm afraid I've got my foragers foragers hat on here. Uh, you get these on oak trees. This was in a hedge uh, over in uh, east. Uh, East Dorset, uh, rather splendid uh, chicken of the woods, uh, edible of course, just the edge. Next, that's about that's about two meters high. That stack of uh, of chicken of the woods. So we're going from very tiny to very large. Next, uh, 
Oh, yes, I've got a name there. I think that's what it is. Um, I, I, there may be a Rust expert. Yeah, I, I kind of love this sort of thing. Rust fungi are, um, are, are wonderful. I think it's one of those things like plant galls that uh, sort of creep up on you in your old age. As you've been wandering around your hedges for ages and you know most of the plants you're going to find in a hedgerow. Well, I can't say I do that, but um, uh, and then you start seeing these wonderful things on leaves and uh, really uh, a, a healthy hedge is about the worst thing you want to see. You want to see it diseased because diseases are other organisms which rely entirely on their host uh, host for a survival. So this is uh, very beautiful. There's lots of rust fungi. I, well, the thing I love about rust fungi is they're fairly easy to identify. I was at the um, I was at the launch party of uh, uh, Ellis and Ellis's microfungi on land plants back in 1986 or seven. I think it was. It was like uh, it was a bit like being at the Rolling Stones first gig but in sort of mycological terms very odd people on the BMS I'm one of the normal ones actually I suppose uh next next slide uh oh yes you will know this one I'm sure many of you have seen this before in in the hedgerow of course uh uh, uh uh, roses very common we've seen roses there uh, just now um this is uh the gall of uh diplolepsis rosy and uh, the robin's pin cushion uh, quite remarkable extraordinary things these individual fuzzy blobs are about three or four 80, 80 millimeters in diameter something like that uh grow it and uh, i i'm Again, I'm, I'm sure you know all this, but uh, they are caught. Most people don't. I see them on my on, on my walks with them. Uh, these are caused uh, by. Uh, they are created by the plant on the at the behest of a parasite. I think Diplolepsis is a. Uh, a, a tiny wasp, but it could be a mite. I'm pretty sure it's a wasp, but uh, someone will, will know. I just can't remember. Um, they uh, they lay, lay their eggs. They produce uh, enzymes which cause hydrotrophy. Hy yes, that's the word. Just about. Uh, that makes makes it tissue grow very fast. In, uh, in, introduces apparently, and this is uh, still research stage. I think they introduce. They introduce um, uh, little bits of DNA into the plant material. So instead of making a rose hip or a flower for the rose, it makes a, a fortified dining room for its parasite or the grub of its parasite. There are hundreds of these. They're, they, are, they are very easy to identify. There's a very good book. The book of um, uh, British Gauls is excellent. Uh, all you need to know is the name of the species that it's growing on. And, uh, and you go through a list of things it could be. Uh, so that's much easier, much easier than identifying the wasp or the mite or whatever it is. Next slide, please. Uh, some more galls. I guess you know these. I guess the uh, uh, the spangle gall at the bottom is uh, something I get handed every time I take a, a mushroom walk or a hedgerow walk. Uh, it's... Uh, these are all all rather common. The the oak hop gall is less so uh, than knocker gall. You will all see, and the oak uh, let's call that an oak apple. I think we call that a marble, a marble gall now. Uh, but the the oak apple is actually something larger. Shall I put that there? Okay, next slide, please. Uh, uh, it's not just insects and mites that uh, produce galls. Uh, other organisms can. You perhaps uh, you will if you've had uh, nematode worms in your uh, vegetable plot then you will know the, the, the havoc they can cause but uh, uh, that, there's also bacterial galls uh, but there's also uh, um, fungal galls and these little uh, acorn-like structures growing on a blackthorn uh, started off life well wanting their ambition was to be a slow uh, but the uh, Tafrina prunai uh, decided it was going to make a little home for itself and uh, uh, usurped its uh, reproductive powers for its own purpose remarkable thing next please a uh, tiny little uh, gall on Jamanda speedwell i'm not sure that may be a mite somebody knows somebody let me know afterwards well i could i could look it up it's in the book next slide please sir hello uh I, we this is this is called brian into this one and uh, he knows uh, a lot of lichens and mosses and liverworts and just about every other damn thing uh, and i said come on brian do your bit and i think the next slide will give you uh, his results these mosses he found on that single ash tree and one liverwort which is quite different at the bottom i think that's amazing and the next one please 
uh, this is on the, our set, the same walk. There's a few lichens and mosses there. And next slide, please, to tell you what's what's there. I think I think that's really quite incredible. This is the sort of thing we miss when you know, very few people can do what Brian does. I certainly can't. Uh, can't you know with fungi i'm i'm pretty good but when it comes to this sort of thing i really can't do it and people just do not realize what they what they lose every time they lose a hedge they lose a lot of this stuff uh, which brings me to one thing old hedges are best i'm sorry oxfordshire because I, I, many of yours will be new but they will be old one day if you look after them and the one even the ones you plant now will be one will be old one day we have to look at the the long the long view on this sort of thing because uh, where we, where you're lucky I mean, there's some old hedges uh, in Oxfordshire uh, but where you have these old hedges you can see these wonderful things and they but a lot of them take a bit of time also uh, require uh, good air for the lichen certainly the next one I'm not sure what's next uh, my book actually dealt with with stone with stone walls as well dry stone walls uh, that, I, that I handed Brian that rock as well so next one uh, he just he just stood there. He didn't have to take them home. He just stood there with his lens and came out with that, <laughs> which I think is amazing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this I, I I'm afraid this is uh, Brian again. This is a, a remnant of a hedge, and we saw some remnants earlier. Uh, uh, do you think they're of no importance? Remnant hedges are of no importance. There were twenty-seven. Uh, lichens on that. Uh, I think it's a peach, so little of it left. There were 27 lichens left on this poor, decrepit beech tree, uh, uh, it, which must be quite ancient, I think, or had a very hard life. Having reached my 70th year, I am tr uh, I'm trying to promote the idea that age brings benefits and uh, maturity and interest. And this is uh, certainly true of this uh, rather unhappy looking tree, but, but highly biodiverse. Uh, as I say, it's a remnant of a hedge. There's standard trees uh, in the line either side of it. Okay, uh, next, and we're nearly at the end, I think. Um, yes, we are at the end. Uh, I think this is uh, looking over Devon. Uh, I think the, uh, the the two messages I'm, go I'm getting, uh, trying to give you from this is that hedges are endlessly fascinating. They're not just pretty things. They're not just carbon uh, carbon sinks. They are. Um, uh, they're not just a, a resource. Uh, they are. Uh, places of huge biodiversity if they're left alone long enough. That's it from me. Thank you very much.